Most of the time when I embark on such an investigation, it quickly becomes clear that matters are much more complicated and ambiguous several shades grayer than I thought going in. Not this time. The deeper I delved into the confused and confusing thicket of nutritional science, sorting through the long-running fats versus carb wars, the fiber skirmishes and the raging dietary supplement debates, the simpler the picture gradually became. I learned that in fact, science knows a lot less about nutrition than you would expect that in fact, nutrition science is, to put it charitably, a very young science. If still trying to figure out exactly what happens in your body when you sip a soda, or what is going on deep in the soul of a carrot to make it so good for you, or why in the world you have so many neurons, brain cells, in your stomach, of all places. It's a fascinating subject, and someday the field may produce definitive answers to the nutritional questions that concern us, but, as nutritionists themselves will tell you, they're not there yet. Not even close. Nutrition science, which after all only got started less than 200 years ago, is today approximately where surgery was in the year 1650 very promising, and very interesting to watch, but are you ready to let them operate on you? I think I'll wait a while. One of Guinness World Records' more unusual awards was presented at the National Maritime Museum yesterday. After a 100-day trial, the timepiece known as Clock B, which had been sealed in a clear plastic box to prevent tampering, was officially declared, by Guinness, to be the world's most accurate mechanical clock with a pendulum swinging in free air. It was an intriguing enough award. But what is really astonishing is that the clock was designed more than 250 years ago by a man who was derided at the time for lien incoherence and absurdity that was little short of the symptoms of insanity, and whose plans for the clock lay ignored for two centuries. The derision was poured on John Harrison, the British clockmaker whose marine chronometers had revolutionized seafaring in the 18th century, and who was the subject of longitude by Diva Sobel. His subsequent claim, that he would go on to make a pendulum timepiece that was accurate to within a second over a 100-day period, triggered widespread ridicule. The task was simply impossible, it was declared. But now the last laugh lies with Harrison. At a conference, Harrison decoded, towards a perfect pendulum clock, held at Greenwich yesterday, observatory scientists revealed that a clock that had been built to the clockmaker's exact specifications had run for 100 days during official tests and had lost only five-eighths of a second in that period. It's important to realize that the brain doesn't see the world around it simply as though the scene was projected onto a cinema screen on the inside of your skull. 
Before a scene can be observed in your head, it has to be broken down into a number of different components for processing, and these components then have to be recombined into the meaningful form that we call an image. Amongst other things, the scene is broken down into its different colors, red, green and blue, in a way that's analogous to the manner in which a television image or magazine photograph is broken down into tiny dots of primary colors, which are too small to be noticed individually when we look at them, but which when seen collectively give the impression of a continuous full-color image. However, unlike in magazine images, the image that we see with our eyes is broken down not only into separate color components, but into other components too. It is, rather incredibly, deconstructed into component parts such as horizontal lines, vertical lines, circles and so on. Each of these component parts is sent to a separate area of the brain for processing, with the different components of the scene only merging again when they are unified into what you perceive as the image. With a good system of crop rotation, and especially with the addition of any sort of fertilizer you may be able to come up with, it's possible to grow crops on a plot of land for upwards of two to three years at a time with good results. Ultimately, though, you must let the land rest if you hope to continue farming there in the long run. Allowing a plot of land to rest for a period of time is known as letting the field go fallow, and there are several reasons for this. Allowing a field or plot to lie fallow means that you don't grow anything new on it, don't harvest anything and don't graze any animals on the land for at least a year. Sometimes a field will lay fallow for two, three, or even four years, but the traditional standard on many farms was to let a field lie fallow once every two to three years. This fallow period allows the land to replenish many of its nutrients. The root networks of various grasses or ground covers, like clover, have a chance to expand and grow, which further strengthens the soil and protects it from erosion. During the fallow period, there are many beneficial flora and microfauna, including cyanobacteria, which live in the soil. These microorganisms continue to be active at the root level, steadily improving the quality of the soil so that when you come back in a year or two, you can begin planting food or cash crops anew. The 1920s moviegoer's experience was largely dominated by silent movies, but saw the introduction of synchronized sound. In the 1920s movie stars were really stars, with huge salaries, the fashions and activities of the Hollywood greats echoed around the world and 100,000 people would gather in cities all over the world, including such diverse cities as London and Moscow, to greet Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks when they toured of Europe.
Early silent movies were often accompanied by live piano or organ music and provided enormous entertainment value to audiences captivated by the experience of watching moving pictures on the silver screen. Although there had been previous attempts to introduce sound, it wasn't until 1923 that a synchronized sound track was photographically recorded and printed on to the side of the strip of motion picture film and made it on to a commercially distributed movie. It would still be seven long years before taking pictures gained total supremacy and finally replaced the silent film era. Americans in the mid-19th century could point to plenty of examples, real as well as mythical, of self-made men who by dint of industry, prudence, perseverance, and good economy had risen to competence, and then to affluence. With the election of Abraham Lincoln, they could point to one who had risen from a log cabin to the White House. I am not ashamed to confess that 25 years ago I was a hired laborer, mauling rails, at work on a flatboat, just what might happen to any poor man's son. Lincoln told an audience at New Haven in 1860, but in the free states a man knows that he can better his condition there is no such thing as a freeman being fatally fixed for life, in the condition of a hired laborer. Wage slave was a contradiction in terms, said Lincoln. The man who labored for another last year, this year labors for himself, and next year he will hire others to labor for him. If a man continue through life in the condition of the hired laborer, it is not the fault of the system, but because of either a dependent nature which prefers it, or improvidence, folly, or singular misfortune. As a family therapist, I often have the impulse to tell families to go home and have dinner together rather than spending an hour with me. And 20 years of research in North America, Europe and Australia back up my enthusiasm for family dinners. It turns out that sitting down for a nightly meal is great for the brain, the body, and the spirit. And that nightly dinner doesn't have to be a gourmet meal that took three hours to cook, nor does it need to be made with organic arugula and heirloom parsnips. For starters, researchers found that for young children, dinnertime conversation boosts vocabulary even more than being read aloud to. The researchers counted the number of rare words, those not found on a list of 3,000 most common words, that the families used during dinner conversation. Young kids learned 1,000 rare words at the dinner table, compared to only 143 from parents reading storybooks aloud. Kids who have a large vocabulary read earlier and more easily. Older children also reap intellectual benefits from family dinners. For school-age youngsters, regular mealtime is an even more powerful predictor of high achievement scores than time spent in school, doing homework, playing sports, or doing art.
Delivering packages with drones will scale back CO2 emissions in bound circumstances as compared to truck deliveries, a brand new study from University of Washington Transportation Engineers finds. In a paper to be revealed an associate degree coming issue of Transportation Analysis Half D, researchers found that drones tend to own CO2 emissions blessings over trucks once the drones haven't got to fly terribly way to their destinations or once a delivery route has few recipients. Trucks, which may provide environmental edges by carrying everything from garments to appliances to the article of furniture in a very single trip, become a lot of climate-friendly various once a delivery route has several stops or is farther off from a central warehouse. For small, lightweight packages, a bottle of drugs, or a kid's bathing costume, drones contend particularly well. However, the carbon edges erode because the weight of a package increase since these unmanned aerial vehicles have to be compelled to use extra energy to remain aloft with a significant load. By 1984, the Internet had grown to include 1,000 host computers. The National Science Foundation was one of the first outside institutions hoping to connect to this body of information. Other government, nonprofit, and educational institutions followed. Initial attempts to catalog this rapidly expanding system of networks were simple. Among the first was Archie, a list of FTP information created by Peter Deutsch at McGill University in Montreal. However, the greatest innovation in the Internet was still to come, brewing in an MIT laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The World Wide Web, or the Web, is often confused with the Internet. In fact, it is just one part of the Internet, along with email, video conferencing, and streaming audio channels. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee, now a scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, introduced a new system of communication on the Internet which used hyperlinks and a user-friendly graphical interface. His slice of the Internet pie camera to be known as the World Wide Web. Berners-Lee says, the web is an abstract, imaginary, space of information. On the net, you find computers, on the web, you find documents, sounds, videos, information. On the net, the connections are cables between computers, on the web, connections are hypertext links. The web exists because of programs which communicate between computers on the net. According to Dr. Ron Fessenden, MD, MPH, the average American consumes more than 150 pounds of refined sugar, plus an additional 62 pounds of high fructose corn syrup every year. In comparison, we consume only around 1.3 pounds of honey per year on average in the U.S. 
According to new research, if you can switch out your intake of refined sugar and use pure raw honey instead, the health benefits can be enormous. What is raw honey? It's a pure, unfiltered, and unpasteurized sweetener made by bees from the nectar of flowers. Most of the honey consumed today is processed honey that's been heated and filtered since it was gathered from the hive. Unlike processed honey, raw honey does not get robbed of its incredible nutritional value and health powers. It can help with everything from low energy to sleep problems to seasonal allergies. Switching to raw honey may even help weight loss efforts when compared to diets containing sugar or high fructose corn syrup. I'm excited to tell you more about one of my all-time favorite natural sweeteners today. Let us begin by asking why the conviction that our language is decaying is so much more widespread than the belief that it is progressing, in an intellectual climate where the notion of the survival of the fittest is at least as strong as the belief in inevitable decay, it is strange that so many people are convinced of the decline in the quality of English, a language which is now spoken by an estimated half-billion people, a possible hundredfold increase in the number of speakers during the past millennium. One's first reaction is to wonder whether the members of the anti-slovenliness brigade, as we may call them, are subconsciously reacting to the fast-moving world we live in, and consequently resenting change in any area of life. To some extent this is likely to be true. A feeling that things ain't what they used to be and an attempt to preserve life unchanged seem to be natural reactions to insecurity, symptoms of growing old. Every generation inevitably believes that the clothes, manners, and speech of the following one have deteriorated. We would therefore expect to find a respect for conservative language in every century and every culture and, in literate societies, a reverence for the language of the best authors of the past. In order to have a competitive edge, athletes often use drugs with high athletic performance. The National Honey Board recently found that honey has the same functions, but less negative impact. This clinical trial is the third in a series of studies focusing on the use of honey by athletes. The first study, involving 71 subject, determined that honey has a milder effect on blood sugar than other popular forms of carbohydrate gel. The second study in the series, with 39 weights trained subjects, investigated the combination of honey with a protein supplement and suggested that honey speeds muscle recovery after a workout. 